my mental health. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to everybody that's watching online. Welcome to Newark Wellbeing Show. Uh, I wanted to do a talk this morning about happiness, <coughs> excuse me, and expectations. And so I have three questions for you to start off with. There's no right or wrong. It's just your opinion. I'm not going to ask anybody for their opinions or all the numbers. It's just some questions for you to think about maybe during this talk. So the first question is, how much of the time should we be happy? So should that be that we're happy 50% of the time and unhappy 50% of the time? Or should we be happy a third of the time and kind of okay a third of the time and unhappy a third of the time? How much of the time should we be happy? Just something for you to think about. The second question is, if you saw a movie and it was okay, it was neither good nor bad, how would you rate that on a score of 1 to 10? Where would your okay be? And again, there's no right or wrong, it's just your opinion. And the third question is, are we better to have high expectations that are met some of the time, or low expectations that are met all of the time? Ooh. I can literally see the cogs turning. Wow. Okay. So we all recognize, I think, that life is a roller coaster. Yeah, that there's ups and downs, and every time we kind of get to the top, we know that there's going to be a, a downturn sometime soon. But we also know that when we're at our lowest point, that it's going to pick up, that life's going to get better for us. I was watching a documentary a few years ago about climbing Everest, which is kind of a good thing about uh, setting goals, about climbing mountains. And the way that they climb Everest is that they go to the base camp and set up, and then they go up to what's called base camp one, and then they come back down again after a couple of days. And then they go to base camp two for a couple of days, and then down to one, and then up to three and down to two, because they have to get used to the, the limited oxygen supply. And like when they get to the top, they're there for about 20 minutes, and then they come all the way down. It takes them weeks. And life's a bit like that, that we go, take two steps forward and one step back in progress. That's how they get up to up Everest. With regards to happiness, my old man had a friend, and, and he always used to say of this friend, he's only happy when he's miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and some people seem to be like, be like that, that they're just in a, a constant uh, state of unhappiness, that they seem happy with that, they're okay. But we also see people that are constantly happy. You see them people that every time you see them, yesterday was the best thing they'd ever done, ever. And it can be a bit draining. Uh, there's something that they're not probably looking at when they're happy all the time. But equally, if you're unhappy all the time, you're possibly not looking at things as you maybe ought to. Just to go back to question two for a second, was how would you rate an okay movie? The research says that most people will pick seven. I would pick seven. That would be my okay. And the reason for that is because we have what's called a negative bias. So if we think okay is a seven, we have six, five, four, three, two, one to think about the negative things in our life or things that are happening to us. For the positive things, we only have eight, nine, and 10. It's like, okay, good, amazing, and out of this world. And that negative bias keeps us safe. That's why we have it. It's better to be safe than sorry. So we want to think about, if we've never seen a saber-toothed tiger before, we want to approach it slowly. We want to be cautious. We don't want to just give it a big hug because we'll probably get eaten. Right? So this is a, an evolutionary thing over millions of years. 
And as hunter-gatherers, we find food every day. And so it becomes kind of the normal that you expect to find food every day. And then the one day that you don't find food, it has a massive effect on us. So our unhappiness has a way bigger effect than the happiness. We kind of get used to that norm. So how do expectations help us? If I go into a restaurant, I would expect good food. That would be a given. But I would also expect it to be clean. I would expect the people to be polite. I would expect good lighting, a nice environment. So the expectation can also keep us safe because if the, if the place is unclean, I'm probably not going to eat there. So my expectations do have an upside, but they seem to also have a massive downside. We compare ourselves to other people all of the time. When I was planning this, I was looking at um, the UK average wage for full-time people. And I, did it, I, I looked at it for quite a while, because I'd always thought that the UK average wage would be uh, manipulated by all the football players and the, and the people, kind of the top earners. But actually, the, what the government do is they use what they call the median average. And what that means is that if you put the lowest paid at this end and have one line of people to the highest earners at the other end, the median is the guy in the middle. It's the guy who has 10 million people to the left and 10 million people to the right. The guy right in the middle is earning 31,000 a year. So when we compare ourselves to each other, like anyone that's earning lower than 31,000, you're below average. I'm below average. And that doesn't always work well with us. Again, there was some, some research done People would be happier earning 40,000 a year if everybody around them was earning 30,000 than they would to be earning 50,000 if everybody around them was earning 60,000. They'd rather earn less as long as they're earning more than everybody else, <laughs> which seems like a bit of a... Like, uh, but when I, when I saw that, I was like, that can't be right. I would want everybody around me to be earning more money than me if I was going to be earning 50000 But the research doesn't show that because we compare ourselves to each other. We compare cars. What's our next door neighbour got? A lot of people seem to aspire to Ferraris, which is all well and good, unless the next bloke's driving a self-driving hovermobile. Then only the poor people are driving Ferraris. We've all seen, I think, the, the films of Africa where you get young children with no shoes, but they're playing football and they're, they're having a great time. They have low expectations. They don't recognize that we all want Ferraris. It just appears that they're way happier than we are. The richest country in the world is America, so they say, and yet, in the standings, they're the 17th happiest. The happiest countries in the world are Scandinavian, so Denmark and Norway. And I think one of the reasons for that is Carlsberg Lager. <laughs> well, it would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> right. But their, their, their catchphrase is probably the best lager in the world. It's not definitely the, the best beer in the world is probably they kind of lower their expectations a lot of research into that you know that they're not trying to attain everything they're not the best probably the best I think technology is warping our perspective when we're airbrushing supermodels it just seems a bit weird the reason that the most beautiful people are the most beautiful people, I don't know whether you know this, is that they're the most symmetrical. So if you took a line, if you took a picture of somebody and took away this half and then folded this half over to get a full picture, the supermodels would look exactly the same. I would look completely different. 
Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's my partner. We'll come we'll talk about her later. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't heckle the talker, right? <laughs> On my bucket list, I would love to go and see the Northern Lights. I'm going to have a go at this. Aurora Borealis. I've been practicing that all week. Aurora Borealis. The Northern Lights. It just seems like amazing, the, the colours in the sky when you go up to Iceland or up to the top of Scandinavia. My, my worry is that it won't look anything like I've seen it on Google Images, like the pictures that you see, the, the colours are so amazing that I'm not sure that my expectations now are so warped that I would go there and go, hmm, more than lights, okay. It worries me about my expectations. We're poor predictors of the future. We're the only animal, as far as we're aware, that actually recognises that there is a future. And we've only been able to recognise that, they reckon, for about two million years, which in the scheme of things, like we've been developing over the last 250 million years, it's only recently that we can predict the future, or think we can. If we could predict the future, we'd be picking our own lottery numbers, we'd all be millionaires. It's very difficult to predict the future, I think. So if we're not good at comparing ourselves to each other and we're not good at predicting the future and we're never negatively impacted by technology, doesn't it doesn't bode well that our expectations are helping us a great deal. It's how do we learn to live, I think, with our expectations. There's a reason in society, I think, why we're more depressed, we're more suicidal, we're more medicated than we've ever been before. We become very used to our situation. There was research done years ago about lottery winners and amputees. And what they did was they interviewed lottery winners a year after they'd won. I think it was over, you just got to win, I think it was at least 10 million pounds. And how did they feel 12 months on? And they also interviewed people that had lost limbs. And they interviewed them 12 months later. And the outcome was that they all thought life was a seven. They all kind of just pick that as their, as their norm because we get used to what we have. It would be interesting, I think, if we could rejig our scale so that it became a five, so that eight, okay was in the middle. I do the lottery, but I only do it when it's like a multiple rollover, when it's only like 40 million or more. Because like, is, is three million really gonna change me? You see, so I, I'm not sure why I do that. In fact, knowing what I know, yeah, quite, yeah. I, I, um, I check my lottery. I normally buy a couple of tickets, so it's normally a fiver. That's what it normally costs me. And I won two pounds ninety. And I, I asked the girl whether she, she thought I was a winner or a loser, because it cost me five pounds to win two ninety. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think we. We missold a dream. Our generation and the generation that follows us, because we're told that we can be prime minister and we can be astronaut. We're told that we're unique and we're special. And I think we are unique and special. And I think there is a chance that somebody has to be prime minister and somebody has to be an astronaut. But very rarely are we actually told reality. We seem to be striving to be forward, forward, ever forward which is okay until, until he stood on the edge of the cliff. Then it just seems like backwards, backwards, always backwards seems better. We're always striving for more. I don't think that we should set small goals. I think that we should set huge goals. 
to be slightly realistic about that and recognize that we can break these down into small achievable goals. Our expectations are hindering us way more than they're ever helping us. I think life is a team sport. We often try, particularly I think as, as middle-aged white males, we're often trying to do things on our own when we should be working together. The best story, I'll come to this in a second actually, Ian's part of the team here. If I wasn't, if I wasn't here, Ian would really struggle with this presentation. But also, I can't do it unless Ian puts the technology together and Liz books the hall and does the advertising. We're all part of the team and all the people that are standing here at New at Wellbeing Show. We're all part of the team. Don't work on your own. The best example of teamwork I've got is, m is my partner, Becky. She doesn't know I'm going to say this, so I might get killed later. <laughs> she always has my back. I think we both recognize that if, if she wins, we win. If I win, we win. I would say, even though I say so myself, I'm pretty good with Christmases and birthdays. Right? I'm pretty good. I tend to get that fairly sorted. Anniversaries, mm, it's kind of 50 50. <laughs> yeah, well, that <laughs> helps, right? Not last year, the year before. The day before our anniversary, Becky says to me, we was getting ready for work. She says to me, I'm really looking forward to our anniversary tomorrow. I gave her a big hug and said, me too. It's been another amazing year. And in my head, I'm going, holy cow, I forgot again. How many times do we expect our partner to remember anniversaries that they forgot the last 10 years? Can we help them out? Can we make the team win? Do we really expect our teenagers to tidy their rooms? Did we tidy our rooms? No. <laughs> right? Shaking their head. Right? have realistic expectations. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask our teenagers to tidy the rooms. It shouldn't be that we don't set them achievable goals. We could lead by example, make sure that our rooms are tidy. I had a client who, who was telling his, his child off for swearing and he swore like a trooper. He's gonna swear if you swear. The key, I think, is to keep growing, is to set goals, but keep achieving mentally, physically, spiritually. And spiritually, if whatever that means for you, that could be religion, but it might not. For myself, I call myself a pantheist, and I would think that probably nobody here or, or watching online has probably not heard of a pantheist. Check it out as a, on the website. Whatever your spirituality means to you, try and let it grow, try and let it develop, but also <coughs> learn. They say that there's only two things that ever change you, the people that you meet and the books that you read. I don't read very much nowadays, but I watch a hell of a lot of YouTube, like learning stuff. There's so much information out there that we can help ourselves grow. I was talking to two ladies earlier um, and just saying how much Netflix we've all been watching. We just got rid of Netflix because we've watched, we've, we've covered it all. So we've got Amazon Prime there. Uh, we're watching so much television, it's unbelievable. But when it gets to nine o'clock and you're feeling a bit peckish, is that actually that you're peckish or are you actually bored because you've watched so much telly? And so you use food to make yourself happy. And is that why we're all carrying a stone of extra weight through COVID? 
not my fault it's COVID. Honestly. We can recognize what we call assumed similarity bias. Bias is a really interesting to- topic. I'm going to do a talk on that sometime this year. Not sure when. There's a lot of different bias. But assumed similarity bias. It means that we think other people think like we do. They don't. Try not to judge the people around you. Don't judge yourself harshly. Don't judge them harshly either. Let them be who they are. To recap, I've nearly done. <laughs> He's woke up. Hey. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Judge yourselves and others less. Be kind to yourself. We talk to ourselves appallingly. We wouldn't talk to other people how we talk to ourselves. Be kind to yourself. Help others achieve their dreams. Be part of a winning team, whoever that is, whether it's work, whether it's social. Help each other. Be more present. Think less about the future. Be where you are in this moment so that you can lower your expectations, be less disappointed, you're more likely to achieve your goals. It's very quiet. I'm very impressed with you all. (laughs) Does anybody have any questions about happiness or expectations? Is there anything that I've not covered? It's very quiet. <laughs> you can always rely on Ian to come up with something. I think, I think we've been sold the dream that we should be happy 100% of the time, that we should always be happy, we should always be striving for success. But it's unrealistic. My cat's just died. Hooray! Seems really weird. Yeah. There's going to be times where we're unhappy. There's going to be times when we're bored, And we don't need a biscuit to sort that out. We can just sit in that boredom. We can just sit with that unhappiness. I'm not saying that we should be happy forever. I think we want to be realistic. And this comes back to the question right at the start. How much of the time should we be happy? Because I think TV sells us the idea that we should be happy 90% of the time, maybe 80% of the time. And then 10% of the time we should be okay. I think it's unrealistic to think that we're going to be happy all of the time. With my, with my work, with my coaching, I'm trying to find the things that people are avoiding. So when we, when we work with people, as life coaches, we ask, where are you today? Where do you want to be tomorrow? And how are you going to get there? And most people know where they are. They know what their issue is but they're not quite sure how they're going to get to where they want to be. Or they might not even know where that is. Like a plane that's taken off, but they don't know where it's going. Like we need a destination. We do need goals. We should set our, our goals high and not necessarily expect to get there. Yes, Alan. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. The, the, the level of medication nowadays and the lack of quality, affordable counselling. I think the health service, they, they put millions and then billions of pounds into mental health. And yet what's happening doesn't appear to be working. Yes, Alan. I, 
Ian, can they can online hear the what the they can hear? Okay. My personal opinion is no, it won't be re regulated. I think we regulate it by what we watch. I think television is dead and buried, like uh, like uh, the ordinary you know, BBC One, Two, Three, uh, ITV. I, yeah. And and I think that's that's the issue that the public gets what the public wants. I think we watch, or a lot of people watch EastEnders because it makes them happy compared to the miserable life that other people have got, which seems a bit bizarre because it's all made up anyway. I don't think, I don't necessarily think it's for regulators to sort this out. I think we have to take personal responsibility. There's been a lot of talk online about the new uh, highway code. That seems really strange that you're giving a cyclist the priority over a lorry. That seems back to front to me. Like because a lorry is way, it's way harder to stop than it would be for the cyclist to brake and not get caught under the... It seems to be that we, we're taking the responsibility off the individual and putting it on the state or the kind of mollycoddling us. I think if you're a pedestrian walking out, you should be looking first before the car comes around the corner. The car's going to really struggle to, to stop if he's doing 30 mile an hour going around the corner. I don't know. It just seems to, it just seems to me that I want to take responsibility for me and my actions and my results. I can help you guys, but I can't do it for you. I can't do your press up. That's a great point. Thank you for that. Yes, Molly. That is a good question. I think it's different for everybody. I think everybody finds their, their own happiness. I'm not 100% sure, and I'm still thinking this over, that happiness is actually what we should all be looking for. I think it could be fulfillment. Because happiness always seems so fragile. If I offered you a piece of chocolate cake, you'd probably be happy. But if I passed it to you and dropped it, you'd probably be unhappy. It seems so fleeting, happiness. Whereas fulfillment, I'm fulfilled in my job, but then I've been doing it five years. It took me a long time to, to get there. But I was fulfilled in my previous job. I was a dance teacher before that. I did 10 years teaching salsa and swing and, and modern jive. And then before that, I had 15 years as a nurseryman growing flowers. But when I got to the end of it, was, I did 15 years and I thought, I've had enough. I need something different. So I became a dance teacher. Like I was already dancing, but I wasn't trained like classically or anything. <laughs> And then when I'd done 10 years of dancing, I was like, hmm, I'm not learning anything. I'm not growing as a dancer. I'm not growing as a teacher. I need to do something different. So I started life coaching. I think happiness is, is how you find it. Are you happy? Yeah, that's good. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Are we generally happy people? Not convinced. <laughs> that, that was like the smallest nod. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's it's up and down. It's a roller coaster. Like my, my hap. My percentage. I think. I think it changes. I think. So I I work full time for a charity. And then I do my life co coaching as a side hustle. I maybe shouldn't say this on, on the internet where it's recorded, but working for a charity is not well paid. So I top it up with some private work. I think it depends a little bit on my clients and how people are doing, because I, I think of myself as part of the team. So when they're struggling, it, it affects me. I try not to take my work home. But I've been, the last couple of days, I've had a couple of, of things that have, knocked me off kilter a little bit. I didn't sleep well last night. 
but I know that their life is their life and my life is mine. And so being here amongst friends and talking to people here, I'll have a good weekend this weekend. I know I will because I always do it with you. I don't know how much of the time I'm happy. I don't really, ju I don't judge it, I guess, is, is, the, is the honest answer. Thank you, thank you for that. <sighs> Obviously. <laughs> And, and the, the definition of expectation is a strong feeling that something should happen. Well, if it should happen, you're almost destined to fail anyway because, as you say, there's so many external factors that we have to take into account. And so it's trying to be happy in the moment. I always look on the bright side. I think I annoy some of my work colleagues because I, I can find the positive in pretty much anything. There's two sides of the same coin, happiness and unhappiness. So when something, when something happens that's not good, try and find the good in it. It's always there. It's always there. Yes, Mark. For sure, for sure. The, the issue that I have with contentment, for me, is that it could lead to complacency, which could lead then to boredom and kind of a, a, a gradual, that we get used to what we have. So I think we can be content in the moment, but you don't want to necessarily be a, a year-long contentment for me. I, I did, um, I went on Google because like Google is the font of all knowledge uh, about, I don't know, 12 months ago. I went online and I put, does the Dalai Lama get angry? <laughs> right? <laughs> because you think contentment, this is what made me think, contentment, you think, who is the most content person on the world? You think the Dalai Lama, you would think he's like got it sorted. Does the Dalai Lama get, get angry? And somebody had asked him this in an interview, and he'd said, it was a few years ago, I think the interview was, and he'd said he gets angry at the little things that his staff do wrong that they shouldn't. And you go, holy cow, if he's getting angry at the little tiny things, there's hope for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Contentment's a funny word, I think. A funny word. I think we have to be con careful with contentment. But I think we have to be careful with happiness. We have to be careful with expectation. We have to be happy with a lot of things. Thank you so much for turning out. It's great to see everybody. Oh! <laughs> My partner, Becky, we're going to be on our stand all weekend. I hope you'll come and, and have a chat to us uh, about anything, about anything. Uh, the guys online, I hope that's been of use to you. Come and see us. Uh, there's 80 or 90 stalls here. We're at Newark Showground. Uh, it's only just off the A1, so it's really easy to find, easy, easy to get to. Uh, you can pay on the door. Come and see us. Thank you very much to Ian and Liz for running the event. Thank you very much.